Hey everybody, welcome back to some more early morning barking, talking about BPD and MPD by somebody that has both, and today with somebody that has neither, which makes a refreshing change for around here. So uh, I'm joined by Dr. Ruth Harper. If you haven't watched our last video together, it's over on her channel. Go and check that out. There is a link in the description below. Um, we're just going to carry on from where we were. I've lost my train of thought. What were we just talking about? Sex and porn. Sex and, and porn. Yeah. Because we've had this right, so it, it's kind of been like a therapy session for me, in that we did the <laughs> we did the talk, and then I've had a couple of weeks to like think about it and process it, and now I can come back and do the whole like, well, this is what I've thought of, kind of thing, and and so, yeah. So what have you thought of? Well, I I think the the big thing, you know, because we do, we were just briefly talking about that tweet that I was still very much in a place of trying to blame porn for everything. Like it, I was in this place. Yeah. You say all that, but it's, it's a porn addiction, isn't it though? That kind of thing. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and yeah, it's clearly not to do with the porn. It's really not. And the, the thing that has, the thing that actually got me onto this this way of thinking is there's no withdrawal. There's no there's a lot of things that you would associate with addiction, habitual use of something that aren't part of it. So if I'm in any other way occupied, busy, doing something, whatever, then it never enters my head. It, it never comes into it. I can go away on holiday and not think about things for a long time, and that's fine. There's all these situations where if it was an actual addiction, then I, I'd have been a mess or, or trying to do something about it or, or something like that. And that doesn't and has never existed. And there's no there's no withdrawal. There's no like, oh, I, I'm missing it. I have to get back to it. Somebody please show me some porn. That kind of thing. It's not like... You know, I, I smoke cigarettes. I know what an addiction feels like. And it's not that. It's it's something clearly a different problem. Um, how, do you, how do you see, see it now? What do you think? Because we talked a bit about kind of when someone's porn use causes them a problem, mm. whether it's because they're using porn so much it's stopping them from being able to engage in other meaningful activities it's affecting their work or poor news that affects relationships mm -hmm. like how do you how do you see that now i i see that well i mean the way i'm seeing the porn use at all is it's almost sort of a self comfort thing it's a, mm. and almost a dissociative thing. It's a, it's a zoning out. It's a removal of oneself from reality, and from having to deal with stuff. And I'm I'm starting to realize that doing all of that within a relationship and to a damaging degree is indicative of how big a problem there is that you're avoiding. That's kind of what yeah. it feels like. So if I'm, you know, the the more down, the more stressed, the more anxious, whatever it is that pushes you in that direction, the more that that's happening, the more you're going to go in that direction and stay there. Um, and so looking at my myself and my own personal history, of course, I was deep in the throes of that because my life and the relationship that I was in and everything else was was horrible and upsetting and stressful and anxiety causing and all of that and yes the porn sort of made it worse but that just became part of it and it just sort of snowballed um and so it was yeah it's it's not about the porn it just looks like it is but the, the it's just a release it's a zoning out it's a can't deal with this anymore kind of thing well it's the use of porn to self-soothe yeah it's like a form of self-comfort especially if you don't feel connected in your relationship mm -hmm. and 
you, you know, and in some ways there's nothing wrong with that inherently. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a sad state of affairs, but it's not someone's fault or, you know. And then it's also, uh, it becomes a distraction in the relationship, especially if you have a lot of shame and blame around porn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, especially if, if problems in your relationship are regarding sex as well, because then it, it becomes this, this big wedge that is, is difficult to get past and you become the problem. So if you sort of like, well, there's, there's been no intimacy in a relationship, the stress, the anxiety, the worry of that pushes you in a porn direction, then the problem becomes, well, there is no sex and intimacy because of the porn. And you start to believe that that is true even years after when you've made multiple YouTube videos about it. Um, and it's, it's difficult to adjust to the idea of, I wasn't doing a bad thing. I just felt awful. And that was the way I reacted to how I felt. Mm. Um, Cause you don't choose it. You know, it's not a, it's not a preference. You'd rather be doing the real thing. That's, I mean, surely that's the case for everybody. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And I, I think there's some other stuff going on there. Um, certainly for me personally, I don't know how common it would be, but there is a, there is something about the lack of intimacy in porn that is also comforting. Yeah. And I think that is really common. Well, mm. first of all, I think it's common for most people to some extent. Right. Okay. But, and it's not even necessarily an unhealthy thing to explore your body, to masturbate, which is what most people are doing when they watch porn as well, mm -hmm. to get aroused is kind of one, it's fun. <laughs> it's naturally an enjoyable sensation. It also kind of gives you a chance to explore what you like on your own. It does. It and does. That's fine. I, I, th I mean, the tricky thing is, I think that what, what you're describing is sort of normal, healthy use mm. of porn. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily, I mean, it's not what I was going through in the end, because it's not about arousal and all of that. You're not even aroused when you're watching it. You know, it, it stops having that effect on you pretty quick, to be perfectly honest. There's a lot of desensitization to it, um, which, which, again, is indicative of just overuse and all that sort of thing. It makes sense that it would do that to me. Um, but, yeah, it, it just becomes about that escape, about not having to deal with reality. Mm. It's the use of something, it's kind of anything, and you could do it with anything. You could do it with internet use. Oh, God, you yeah. You could do it with food. You could do it with booze. You could do it with drugs. You could do it with... I, I mean, yeah. The, do it what, with socializing. Yeah. I mean, what we're talking about is is it in, essentially, as I always had it explained to me, the biggest use of people starting to take heroin. You know, just because that's one of the... As someone who has enjoyed... Uh, the drug side of life, never to that extreme. You sort of look at that and you think, how could how could anyone get into that? Have you not seen Train Spotting? Like, you know, why why would you start doing that? And the answer is, well, because it's an escape for people because their life is so fucking awful hmm. that 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 was a nice alternative for a while. Hmm. And it's you know, it's that same. Thing that a bad life unhappiness can push us to all kinds of extreme things to try and just feel something good or not feel bad like we have been mm. um i guess in many ways i was lucky it was porn yeah <laughs> you know there I, are many 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 more destructive things you can use to escape and self-soothe and detach yeah one porn i mean sure. what when I look at 
you know some of the unfortunate uh, things people like me go through i i am so lucky that the things i latched onto were were weed and porn because it it could have been alcohol and other drugs it could have there's just so many significantly more destructive things i could have latched onto mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it could have been so far so much worse it's kind of interesting though because there's such a focus on when in these kind of situations where you have someone in a relationship who's using a lot of porn and that's seen as a problem mm. i often think that person becomes very pathologized and you completely lose sight of there's a whole relationship dynamic here and there's at least two people in it yeah yeah and absolutely. i say at least two people because th they also exist in a social context yeah and there are other people involved in their lives that probably also affect this dynamic I, I think the difficult thing with that is is that someone else has to accept blame for something you know someone else has to say well maybe i've contributed to this situation and if there's somebody who is just angry at you for whatever you're doing or whatever then that might be difficult for them to go through um you know again speaking from experience it like we say it's not mm -hmm. something that somebody just falls into on their own mm -hmm. but that that implies someone else had something to do with it and getting somebody to admit that or deal with that is a a, a very difficult thing it doesn't have to be about blame either you know you can recognize that there are reasons someone turns to porn for self-comfort and self-soothing. And there's, you know, there's their own background that leads them to choose that particular pathway. And like you say, it's not the most destructive one in many ways. Mm. And there's also stuff in the relationship. There may be difficulties connecting. There may be also, um, you know, from working with couples in this situation, very often people, the, the other party will often have a whole host of ideas about themselves when their partner's mm -hmm. using porn. Like, it means they're not attracted to me. It means they don't want me. It means they don't desire me. It means I'm not important to them. That are simply not the case. Yeah, that's not that's not the, the case at all. Um Yeah. I, I don't think that people who are genuinely not attracted to their partner, whatever, don't, don't they tend to cheat more? Isn't, isn't that the route people go through when you, when, if it's not about, if it's, if it's really about sort of, I don't, I'm not attracted to them anymore. I don't want to be with them anymore, whatever. So I'm going to go over here and do this. Isn't that more commonly just cheating the way that ends up well, rather than. I mean, some people do cheat as a exit strategy for a relationship mm -hmm. um, or I'm going to explore other relationships before I end this one, which that's not a particularly healthy thing to do. But then again, no. people, people in happy relationships sometimes cheat. That's this is true. This is true. I mean, for me, it was always. It was an alternative to cheating. I didn't want to cheat and I didn't cheat. And I, there was no way I was going to do that because that for me was a definitive mm. end to a relationship. Once you've done that, you're done. That's, that's it. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to lose the relationship I was in. So there was no way I was going to cheat. And porn was sort of a halfway house sort of thing. I wasn't in my mind doing anything wrong. I wasn't doing anything uh, unfaithful or deceitful or anything like that it was just looking at something um and that sort of thing i've i've learned i mean what takes us on to the other bit of it is i i've learned what that has done to my ability to feel intimacy and all of that sort of thing which, which is more about the i i think when when people talk about how it, it retrains watching so much porn retrains your brain and affects this and affects that and that sort of thing. And again, that's another thing I'm shifting position on, that it's about being uncomfortable with intimacy and mm -hmm. with closeness rather than yeah. 
the the pawn and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, I feel like it's another bit, I'm starting to scratch the surface on just how screwed up I actually am. Um, it's one of those weird ones. Like, I, I thought it was bad, but now I think it's far worse than I thought it was in the first place. <laughs> So what you've gone from what pathologizing your porn use to what? Well, to the, there's no no longer the porn use, but there's I'm I'm realizing the issues I have with intimacy, mm. and and how that's all coming out. There is such a lack of self confidence and self belief. All the classic narcissism stuff, for God's sake, actually. <laughs> But this is why I'm so interested in that finding from the study that mm. narcissism was quite strongly associated with identifying as being addicted to porn. Yeah. And I'm um, like, yeah, it's not addiction to porn, is it? It's not being comfortable with intimacy. Yeah. It's not being able to be vulnerable and close with an actual real person. There are so many issues regarding narcissism and intimacy. Mm. And it's, again, it's another one of those, I don't know, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a very untidy, overpacked cupboard of problems. And you open the door and it all starts to fall down. So you shut the door again quickly before it does and sort of walk away. If we don't go in that room. Um, but yeah, it's all about, lack of self-worth lack of self-belief lack of feeling attractive feeling worthy of all of that sort of thing all the stuff we mask against all the stuff that we hide behind and it's all of that and that all comes out and i for me it's i didn't used to have that 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 wasn't there when i was much younger that has been instilled in me over my adult life one way or another and i'm dealing with that now that has become a thing to deal with and work through and try and do something about and it is that it's that it's not a fear of being close to someone but it's a a cautiousness i think it goes with narcissism though doesn't it because it's very much so is you want to be seen as good you want to be seen as whatever your thing is attractive competent mm -hmm. good at sex yes yeah. and there's a lot of performance kind of ideas around sex as well for narcissists like i want to be good in bed i want to be good at sex i want to be the best lover anyone's ever had that's that's part of it and that's a lot of pressure oh yeah oh massively so massively so and it becomes a thing we can't just have sex and it's not just about the intimacy like you say it's like i want to be the best at this i i want to be the best at sex and the, every sex needs to be the best experience of our lives and that sort of thing and of course that's totally unrealistic it's not on every level create erectile dysfunction so you're right sorry say that again i do think that can contribute to erectile dysfunction massively because massively <laughs> there's so. a lot of anxiety and a lot of pressure yeah and it it doesn't take a lot i mean i i think this is something that it isn't said enough really it, it's amazing how easy it is to make that thing not work right it's anything makes it not work that like it's amazing that anyone has ever been born to me at this point because <laughs> And anything are you a bit tired did you eat just a bit too late you know are you thinking about this other thing that, that thing you saw on tv because nothing's working if you're doing that and if you add on genuine worries and stresses of a relationship and anxiety and and the want to be the best whatever the hell that means uh then yeah you've got no chance mm. you straight on to problems anxiousness and all of the things that come with that Mm. which again pushes you back to the pawn because it doesn't matter there. That's the other thing that the pawn is it's people who don't judge you. Uh, it, it's people that just do their thing and leave effectively. Um, and that's, that's a lot easier to live with. 
I think we had a little bit of a time lag there, Rich. Yeah, I think we did a bit. Where, what did you last hear me say? You were... I can't remember. You said it's easy to turn to the porn. Yeah, because it, it doesn't judge you. It, it doesn't have an opinion about you. It's just, it's people that turn up and leave. And that is so much easier to deal with than a real human being. Mm -hmm. But I also imagine that that's one of the things that perhaps leads people to think I'm becoming desensitized because of the porn. Yeah. And actually what's happening is the anxiety about a real relationship where someone sees you not always as the perfect lover mm -hmm. that you're a human sometimes you can get it up sometimes you can't sometimes you're tired that that kind of normal ebbs and flow in any kind of sexual relationship of any duration is just not tolerable and yeah. you become more and more anxious about it and the more and more anxious you get about that the more difficulties you have with sex the harder it is to get aroused the more attractive porn becomes, but it's not about being desensitized because you've got so much stimulation from the porn. It's about the anxiety in the relationship increasing and increasing. Absolutely. And, and so I, on you, that's it. It's, it's, I, I get why, why it's seen as a porn addiction. I get it now because it looks like that so much. Mm -hmm. it, it really does look like we just can't stop watching the porn and if you watch enough porn it desensitizes you and you can't have sex anymore that makes perfect sense it's i i'm starting to realize it's all bollocks yeah it, it, yeah it, it, well david lay who wrote the book the myth of porn addiction or the myth of sex addiction would agree with you yeah i'm i'm agreeing with him now totally yeah. and i kind of need to read that book i think um, because it, it's it's just so far from what you think it is. I'm I'm still kind of stunned by it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, you know what the advice is for kind of managing it in a relationship? No. No. Uh, do you want to know? Yes, please. So the advice generally, and like, I'm not a psychosexual expert, so I'm kind of just drawing on the few bits of training and colleagues I've talked to about this, but I've, you know, I've used this in my own practice, mm -hmm. working with couples and working with people with kind of narcissism flavored issues is you need to take the pressure of performance out of it. That makes sense. So you need to make sex completely focused on pleasure and enjoyment and fun. Mm -hmm. It's not about performance. You just focus on enjoying something with your partner enjoying physical touch and if you get aroused fine if you don't get aroused also fine you don't measure success by your arousal that makes sense it's like relax enjoy it go with the flow and also do a lot of work with the partner around interpreting that reaction mm. you know if your partner doesn't get aroused that's not a reflection of their affection for you, their attraction to you, their love for you. In many ways, it's sometimes a reflection of their wish to impress you and their anxiety about this. That makes sense. Right? It's yeah. easy to get it up watching porn because there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. There's no one to disappoint. The, the That's it. tremendous fear they have is of you being disappointed and you being disapproving. So remove that from the equation. So let's remove that from the equation as much as possible. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. It's when it's couples get that, it's so liberating. Yeah, I I think that requires a the partner to be able to do that with, mm -hmm. which I think for a lot of these guys that i see on reddit and that sort of thing i mean we started off talking about the nofap community and that sort of thing i i think those people having a partner that is ready and willing to go through that with them can be a tricky thing and i i think it's especially a tricky thing if you haven't got a partner at all mm -hmm. um you know um but clearly it is about 
if if you're doing a thing because there's underlying issues, then you need to deal with the underlying issues, and then the rest sort of works itself out one way or another. Mm. I've always felt, um, and this is clearly an issue with a lot of underlying problems. Yeah. If so, do you want to know what I would suggest to someone who's not in a relationship? Absolutely. It would be <laughs> enjoy whatever you enjoy on your own. That's fine. Don't pathologize that. But when you meet someone and you're heading towards sexual contact, own it. Just own it. Be really upfront about it because mm. it just takes the anxiety out of the equation and it will come across as really confident. And you say, you know what? I really like you. I'm really attracted to you. And sometimes when I'm really attracted to someone, my body doesn't necessarily cooperate. And I just want to, in, I want us to enjoy each other. I want us to enjoy this contact. If I can't get an erection, it's not a reflection of how attracted I am to you. It may actually be a, a reflection of my anxiety, my wish to please you. So don't judge it. Don't judge yourself and let's just mm. go with the flow and see what happens i i think i totally agree with that i totally agree with that and and, and most women at this point are like oh my gosh this is a man who's so in tune with his emotions god yeah i, I think right <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there are just so many layers to that i mean right so men if you're talking to a woman who's going through the process of internet dating if mm -hmm. you can have a conversation and that conversation is actually not about all the dirty things you'd like to do, you're, you're ahead of most of the other guys out there, Oh yeah, you know, you know, so just having a conversation about feelings and something you feel and go through. And that thing is about, I might not want as much sex or that kind of thing. It, that's, that's such a relief to like 95% of women, if not all of them. Uh, so uh, communication is, is so the key with it. And, and even when I was in the, you know, when I was sort of recover, I say recovering from it, I, that's not right. When I'd come out of the, the big relationship that I had and started moving into new relationships, I, I was always kind of honest about it because you've got to be, I tried mm -hmm. not being at first. I, I tried not being. And that was before I realized the extent of the problem. And so it became something I had to talk about. And not once did I tell someone and have them go, uh, no, go away. We're done. You know, not once did that happen. It How was, did people respond? It was always reasonably received. Like exactly what you've just described. Like, oh my God, we're having a conversation about feelings. This is good. And that kind of thing. It was, it was never an issue. Um, maybe I was lucky that I never bumped into the kind of person who would have reacted with the, oh God, porn. Ah. And and just being upset with me on that moral level or whatever. But you know what? If they do, that's kind of useful information. Oh God, yeah, that's a total red flag right? for me. Because I'd have, I'd have, that would have been the end of things for me anyway. It's, you know, good to find that out. Yeah, it's like I, I'm not suggesting that we sit and watch porn, and I don't really want to see, see it ever again anyway. But the fact that you're that angry about it means I don't think we're really that compatible. Uh, but it was, it was always a thing that was reasonably well received. It, much the same as telling someone that you've got BPD or MPD. I d just throw it out there. It's coming out. So just throw it out there. And it was always okay. You know, I, I think if we aren't in telling people about personality disorders, it, we, we go to sort of, I've had one person reject me on those grounds. Useful information. And yeah. And even then the person who did it, I remember she explaining like, I've, I, the reason I'm single is because I lost my husband to suicide through mental health. I'm not in a rush to start a new relationship with somebody who might develop suicidal ideation. And you're like, okay. You know, okay. I can understand that actually. Yeah, That's fair not, enough. Uh, yeah, I get how that would feel rejecting, but I also think I can see why someone in that situation, it wouldn't be good for them and it wouldn't be good for their partner either. No. That if you get suicidal ideation, their reaction is going to be, 
absolute terror. Absolutely, because they've they've been through it. So yeah, I that one that it was oh, okay, fair enough, and and it's not like I was being rejected into a relationship and that sort of thing. Yeah. But that was that was the only time. That was the most negative response I've had to any of this. So I I, I think yeah. with with performance anxiety, anything surrounding that, just just say it, just get it out there, and. Uh, I think a lot of women are a lot more understanding than we think. I think so. I, I, I think that's the other part of it. I think so. Um, Especially because you saying it takes out a lot of the thoughts of the other person. The, they're going to be judging you. It takes out their thought that you're judging them, that you're not attracted to them, that you don't really want to be there, that you can't that is something to do with them mm -hmm. when it isn't yeah now interestingly enough i i think i think the pawn does have an effect on us that affects this bit of things and i i think it can perhaps warp our sense of what sex is and what sex involves and it, it it sort of you know so we're talking about you know we'd like to explain the situation to a partner and make sex about that intimate experience that sensation experience all of that sort of thing and i i don't think that's how a lot of men view sex i i don't think that's what we in in our heads it's much more pornographic the, the pressure that we put on ourselves is I need to be like that guy in that video. I need to be able to just go at it hard for however long it is because, and of course every woman wants that as well. Don't they? Of course, that's definitely a thing. Really? No. <laughs> so we get, <clears throat> you know, so I think we, we, yeah. we decide well, I, I have to be a porn star kind of level thing. I have to do all this stuff and it's but that's it's so much more pressure fancy for real life. Yes, exactly. You know, and porn is fantasy. Absolutely. I, I just think that that's a problem both for, for I mean, for young people who are still learning about what sex is and that sort of thing and being exposed to porn way too young or too early, but also to sort of older people who lose touch. With, I think that's what, it, for me, I lost touch with that part of myself for such a long time. And that was just replaced by porn and pornographic content and that sort of thing. And you just build up this, this weird image of what I must be like, what I must be able to do, what is expected of me. And it's all unreasonable. It's all unrealistic. And it, it makes everything worse. Mm. You see, I think the parallel we talked about last time as well around food is a really helpful one there. And that, you know, some people will start to use food for comfort, for self-soothing. They'll binge eat. And it is self-soothing. It also becomes a massive source of shame. And then they go to the other extreme where it's like, I've got to eat like an Instagram influencer. <laughs> and who's like, what do I eat in a day? A kale smoothie for breakfast. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> actually does that. And they certainly don't enjoy it if they do. And then they end up with these sorts of really rigid puritanical ideas around food that actually just provoke another binge because then they're hungry they're not enjoying it they're not satisfied by it and i think it's in a way there's a parallel there with this because if you're like okay for me to have, if your view of healthy sex is either i've got to perform in this particular way or i've got to be only focus solely on my partner, never have a sexual thought about someone or something else, only get aroused. That's not realistic. You know, and it's like, I think if we, we all relax a bit, there's a lot more scope for flexibility and enjoyment and pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I'm very lucky that I'm with someone at the moment who gives me the room to do all this you know it, it, it's it's down to that that communication that just saying how you feel what you need and and 
you know, someone who cares about you is is up for being part of that, for helping you through things, for mm -hmm. you know, being there for you. It's it's good to share it and to uh, talk through it all. It, you know, especially with the person that you're putting that pressure on yourself for, uh, because nothing relieves the pressure like that. It, it's great. Communication is just key in relationships, people. I can't I can't stress that enough. I think. Yeah, and it's it's definitely something we forget about a lot. Um, but what, what else was I going to talk about? We touched briefly on the sexual narcissism thing last time. Um, and and thinking about that again in the context of of what we've just discussed, that again feels to me like a a slightly darker version of removing that intimacy um, from sex, but still having the sex with the removed intimacy and kind of making real life more like porn in that sense. Uh, in the sense of sort of removing responsibility for the other person. It's also sex is performance, isn't it? Yeah, that as well. And Se sex as self-esteem juice. Yeah. I to be honest, I think we see sex as something you can win. You know, it's something that you can be the best at, that you can beat other people at, that you can win. You can do really well. And it, it's all about removing intimacy and all of the other good things about the whole experience and reducing it down to this thing you can do. That, that show it's another thing to show how awesome you are and how mm. much better than other people you are um it's such a bizarre thing how we make everything like that everything is a competition it's interesting as well because what you'll often find people will say is that the their narcissist was the best sex at the beginning at least and i think it's often as well because they're pushing the boat out <laughs> Yeah. They're prepared to explore and they're prepared to be quite sexually adventurous and nothing's kind of forbidden in that sense mm -hmm. there's no there's less taboo and that can be really exciting but then when it's only performance and achievement and it's a notch on the bedpost and it's i'm the best at sex and now tell me what a great lover i am that's such an intimacy killer yeah and then people would just say it's like they feel invisible. They feel erased. They feel like they're a sex toy rather than a partner. Yeah, that's that's not surprising. I think what everybody wants is a narcissist in recovery. They're the ones that are the absolute best in bed because never mind. Uh, <laughs> you get all the enthusiasm at the beginning, but we've got the emotional connection later. It's wonderful. Um I've never needed somebody to tell me I'm the best. I've never gone that far with it, but I'd be lying if I said I've never thought it. You know? Oh, yeah. It's definitely one of those. There's definitely that, well, that was the best sex anyone could have had. That's it. Just that's it. That's fine. Don't need you to tell me I'm the best. I just know it. That kind of thing. It's definitely mm. a thought process. That has but gone then what happens if you have a sexual encounter even a long-term relationship, and it's a little bit of a flop. Oh, it's devastating. It's mm. absolutely crushing. And I, I honestly think, do you know what? I, I honestly think that a lot of insecurities I've ever had in my sexual life stem back to sort of the first one or two sexual encounters of my life. I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think there were uh you know because because things don't things aren't like put on things are like real life mm -hmm. and and things are in real life you were you know very nervous at what was happening not everything went how you imagined it would go all that kind of thing and you these worries from the first time from the second time so just latch on and there are mm -hmm. still things that go through my head now that went through my head years and years and years ago because of that first time oh it went wrong then like well how, how many sexual encounters have you had since 1996 well quite a few uh, none of them went like that one so it 
but still mm. that one is is right there it's right there with me always mm. has been um it's very odd maybe one day i'll get rid of it yeah or maybe you just accept it's there and it's not a commentary on your character that's it your i mean just... or your current relationship that's it. I mean, see reasonably i know that's true right? <laughs> I, of course i know that's true <laughs> like the the you know what that night with my first girlfriend after a night out when i was absolutely shit faced in college that's that's not what is happening to me today but i'm carrying that weight with me and i imagine a lot of us are one way or oh, another yeah. you know there's there's a lot of stuff there um but i'm i'm doing my best to work through it as much as you can you know and i think it's it takes you back to mindfulness again how so because that's about being in the moment and experiencing what you're experiencing mm. and when we're talking about narcissism and sexuality and performance then the last thing you're thinking about is being mm. in the moment that's right you know it, it's that's that's something that i sort of had success with in dealing with some of these issues is slowing everything down and mm. doing that sort of seems weird sex is a mindfulness e exercise but there's yeah. a really good book on that actually called better sex through mindfulness really i'm not yeah. gonna look that up because that's Lar like larry a... brotto yeah there it is which I wish I could say I've read, but I haven't, but I have heard her talk. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, when I think back to the, I did one mindfulness session years ago uh, and, and immediately dismissed, <laughs> the reason I dismissed it was because it was being presented to me at the time of this is what will cure all of your problems before BPD yeah, yeah. or NPD <laughs> had been. So go and do mindfulness. Okay. Yeah. Um, and did I did one. Involve raisins? It did involve raisins. It, it always involves a raisin. <laughs> which I fucking hate. Um, Me too. I used to rebel when I was having to do it as a facilitator. Right. Never really my thing, but sometimes I was kind of I expected to do it. And I used to be like, oh, they didn't have raisins. I brought some Maltesers. <laughs> So we can do it with Malteser, which, which always made me very popular with the patients. I think that's a much better idea. But all of that stuff, I mean, think, you know, thinking about what something feels like, what it smells, tastes like, all of the being aware of your senses, taking time to appreciate that. That's the stuff that builds up the the physical intimacy, that 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 normal, natural feeling of, of being close to someone and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and again, we know, you know, I, I we're not talking about making. I, I, I think this is the other thing we sort of equate. There's the there's the the crazy porn sex, and then mm. there's the quiet, loving, intimate sex, and I, I think we get caught in this trap of thinking uh, the relationship can be one or the other, and it's it's both. You need both things in there. You and know, it'll, it'll wax and wane and change and evolve as it. Absolutely, it there's no couple that are just completely out and out porn sex all the time and 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 the other way is mm. boring too and and too much of anything is a bad thing yeah um it, it's just i i think we get caught up in some serious traps with that um but essentially yeah this is this is all about removing our our this requirement of intimacy in order to just make ourselves feel more relaxed mm. And yes, it comes out in porn, but it comes out in the way we are in our relationships as well. It, mm. It's such a... For sure. It feels like it should be a complicated thing, but I don't think it really is at all. Yeah, in I, some ways it's not. In some ways it is like just... But I think this with a lot of kind of narcissism stuff, I'm like, just relax. <laughs> Let things be. Yeah, we can't do that. Yeah, I know. Uh, just just <laughs> relax. Just just no, no. I have to I have to deal with that until it's fixed or in the way that I need it to be. 
um mm. and yeah just relax that that doesn't come into it and that's not good when you're talking about anxiety and stress yeah um which are both things that affect male performance on every level oh yeah um so we god honestly however surely number of children had by narcissists needs to be smaller at least god it's amazing any of us have been born it really is but yeah so all in all i generally feel much better about the whole thing now we've talked about it there's a lot less i'm glad there's a lot less blame yeah sort of internal blame uh because yeah i'm I'm clearly dealing with a lot of other stuff which was no secret in and of itself i I knew i was dealing with stuff i just didn't you don't realize how it's gonna come out and affect you day to day mm. Mm. but again it could it could have been worse i guess could have been worse could have been. i'm glad it's been a really interesting discussion to have it has hasn't it it has indeed um I, I don't know where to go next with it. I, I don't know if we should just leave it there because I feel like we've reached a sort of Seems to natural, have reached natural end. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I have a whole lot more to explore on this going forward, I think, uh, from a personal level. There's a lot of unpacking that needs doing because, yeah, I've been blaming all of this on a simple addiction. A simple oh there's mm -hmm. this thing and you can't stop doing that thing and it's because of the thing and yeah. no not at all <laughs> not at all it's very weird it is very weird wow well, there's a lot of there's yeah. a, still a lot of journey to go on yeah uh i'll make videos about all of it so at least i get that out of it Absolutely. But, well thank you thank you for coming on the the channel again it's been no, an absolute delight to have you so we'll we'll have to do we'll do something and we'll do a different topic next time and we'll we'll figure something else oh i think the sound's gone weird now yeah oh yeah there we are right anyway so well thank you very much for your time and thank you for watching everybody there'll be more videos and stuff like that you can go and check out you know where to find them all again uh Thank you again for joining me. It's been wonderful. And Thank you for having me, Rich. No problem. Right. You take care and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.